Let me ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Romans, chapter 12. Romans 12, and the first two verses there, as we get underway, say this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, because of all the mercy God has shown you, Forgiving your sins, saving your soul, when you didn't deserve it. It's not unreasonable then for him to ask something of you. It has to do with your body being presented to him. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. One of the most challenging questions in life for Christians and non-Christians is, what is God's will for me? I include non-Christians in that because everyone wants to think that they're making a difference in the world. Everyone wants to think that they are doing the thing that they have exceptional talent at that they were uniquely designed to do. And if they believe in God, or the existence of God, presumably, they want to know what God desires for them. For the true Christian, verse 2 promises that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. To prove means to test something, to, to uh, uh, demonstrate its validity, to take the guesswork out of it, to be sure of it. When it comes to questions such as, where should I live? Where should I work? Should I get married? Where should I go to school? The Bible seems to be very silent about those things. And yet those are the things that we're always worrying about. We want specific answers to those kinds of uh, questions. However, the Bible is clear about some things that are the will of God. Let's examine those things and maybe they'll help us answer the other questions by the time this sermon is finished. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Peter says that the last days would be marked by people denying the deity of Jesus Christ, and Christ's return. We sure have plenty of people like that today. But despite their skepticism, notice chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but he is willing that all should come to repentance. <clears throat> Point number one, God's will is for every man to be saved. That is God's will, that every man in the world should be saved. This is where the un 
saved person, the non-Christian, has to begin if he ever wants to figure out what God's will is for him or her. The Bible says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. In Matthew 12, Christ's mother Mary and his other brothers and sisters were wanting his attention. And it says in Matthew 12, verse 47, Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. Then we read in verses 49 and 50, And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. In other words, the way to get close to Jesus Christ was to do the will of the Heavenly Father first. In the Old Testament, that meant keeping the laws and the commandments in order to establish your righteousness before God. But what if we take Christ's statement and we turn it around? If you want to know the will of God and then do the will of God, you have to get close to Jesus Christ first. That's New Testament. The Apostle Paul says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Titus 3 verse 5. God's will is for all men to be saved. Secondly, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verse 17 says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is is. You're supposed to know it. Then he clarifies that in verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. If you want to know God's will, first, you must be saved. Secondly, you must be Spirit-filled. I preached a sermon about this very subject, to be filled with the Spirit, about two or three weeks back. We won't repeat all of that. But the Bible says, and ye are complete in him, Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. Colossians 2, verse 10. The Bible says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. To be spirit-filled is, is not asking God to give you some extra thing or some new experience, but it is to be fully yielded to what he's already given you. The Holy Spirit himself, the third member of the Godhead, lives inside of you. Amen. <coughs> and you're to be fully yielded to his control. Let him control every a word that comes out of your mouth, everything you do in this life. Let him direct and control you in every area. You might say amen to all that, and that might, but it might seem easier said than done. In practical life, it certainly is easier said than done. But try this. Try this. All day long, when you go to school or when you go to work, all day long, imagine that the Lord Jesus Christ is standing next to you, walking beside you, walking into every room, sitting down at every table you sit, He's on the passenger seat when you drive your car. He's right next to you all day long. And he sees everything you do, hearing every word you speak, and he already knows every thought in your mind. If you're truly saved and a believer, you're going to wonder, would he be pleased to see me doing this thing right now? Would he be offended if he heard what I'm about to say? might catch you from saying something stupid, something unbecoming of a Christian. But God's will is not only for you to be saved, but for you to be spirit-filled. 
Next, turn, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians 4, here's a plain statement, verses 3 through 5. For this is the will of God. Doesn't get much clearer than that. There's nothing ambiguous about that. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you, men and women, should know how to possess his vessel, that's your body, in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. If you're saved, and you're seeking to be spirit-filled, God's will is for you to be sanctified as well. That is to be set apart from the corrupt conduct of the world for his honor. Verse 7 says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, just satisfying your flesh, but unto holiness. When something or someone was sanctified in the Old Testament, it was set apart for some purpose God had, it was then declared to be holy. Those two words, sanctification and holiness, uh, are joined together. That takes us back to our opening text, Romans 12, verse 1, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, and so forth. That's God's will for you, especially in the areas of physical and sexual purity. Man, how this generation needs to hear that. No dirty talk, no dirty music, no dirty movies. No dirty pictures or porno, any of that stuff. Watch how you conduct yourself and watch your gestures, watch your mannerisms, your actions around the opposite sex. Young men, I expect every one of you to be gentlemen. To the young lady who may become your wife one day. Don't be trying to get away with something thinking, well, if her parents don't find out, it's okay. Yeah, it, that makes me think. When an unsaved kid, I, I, I'll, I'll even go beyond that, not even an unsaved kid. When a young man is controlled by his hormones, whether he's saved or not saved, if he's not yielded to the Holy Spirit, he's going to try to get away with things with his girlfriend that he knows he shouldn't, but he figures if no one finds out about it, then no harm is done. But I'll tell you what, and this is the liberal mentality. This is the thinking of a Democrat. Um, get away with whatever you can. But when he becomes a father of his own daughters, he doesn't want some young man trying to take advantage of his daughter. And he doesn't want his daughter to become that kind of girl. That's why... Generally speaking, people become more conservative as they get older. Those things that your parents warned you against and said you shouldn't get involved in, you were young and stupid, you thought, well, do they know? Suddenly, it becomes very personal when it involves your own children one day. And you don't want your son to be the kind of young boy or young man who's out there trying to uh, hurt someone else's daughter. Then you become a Republican. <laughs> but young ladies, likewise, don't give away anything to some young man until they have the approval of your dad and mom, and it's right in the eyes of God. And then you can be married and live happily ever after. Even middle-aged couples who are both professed to be believers, some man, some woman, they're in their 40s, early 50s perhaps. He's been married and divorced, she's been married and divorced, and they meet each other and they're drawn to each other. It's, it's amazing how often these days some young, 
some some couple like that will say, well, we're planning to get have a public um, wedding ceremony next spring, so it's okay for us to live together now. It's okay for us to shack up now. It's okay for us to fool around now. Let me suggest, and I'm only trying to help, that it's not okay. If Jesus Christ is walking beside you, everywhere you go, go back to the previous point. He's going to see what you do. But likewise, younger Christians are going to see what you do. Why don't you set a good example for them? You don't, if you have a conscience as a saved man or a saved woman, you don't want other younger Christian young people to make the same dumb mistakes you made in intimacy when they grow up. And not only are they watching you, but the unsaved world is watching you. Now, I didn't intend to talk about this, but I think I will. As Bible-believing men and women, we understand that a scriptural marriage is when flesh joins flesh. The two shall become one flesh. That constitutes the definition of marriage in the Bible. It's to be distinct from a wedding ceremony, which is a public event where people are invited to attend. You might understand that. But the unsaved world doesn't know that. In their eyes, <clears throat> there's a proper order and a proper sequence. These things should play out. Don't be messing around, fooling around, and so forth until you've made promises and your friends and your family who give you their blessing can then hold you to. And in the eyes of God, he's watching. And everybody that's there video recording and, and so forth uh, can play it back for you and show you what your words were. Do things in a proper order for your own testimony's sake and a clear conscience sake. But God's will is for you to be saved, for you to be spirit-filled, and for you to be sanctified, separate from this wicked world. You may be saved, but how do you measure up the next two points. Fourth, let me have you go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter 2, verses 13 to 15. 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 15. It says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him, by the king, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Now notice, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. We don't live under a king or a monarchy, but God's will is for you to be in submission to authority that's over you. That is, if you're a Christian, you are supposed to be a good citizen. You're supposed to be a model citizen in the society in, in which you live, in, in the eyes of the unsaved world around you. You're to, be, you're to be in submission to the boss where you work. You're to be... Kids, you're supposed to be in submission to your parents, in submission to your school teachers. A driver is supposed to be in submission to the highway patrol and the laws of the road, right? And the, and the speed limits. And church members, and this is difficult for me to mention because it involves me personally. But the Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account. Hebrews 13, verse 15. If I ever say anything from this pulpit that strikes a chord in you, something you needed to hear and needed to be reminded of, don't just wrestle and be uncomfortable until next week's sermon. Do something about it. Amen. Follow the admonition. Right. 
But it's God's will for you to be, number one, saved, number two, spirit-filled, number three, sanctified, and fourthly, in submission to authority over you. Ask a Calvinist someday if he believes the Lord God of the Bible is sovereign in every uh, one of his works and his decrees, to which he's going to say yes if he believes his church's doctrine. <laughs> Yet all of these things that we've listed so far are the expressed, stated will of God on the pages of the scripture, and every one of them can be uh, rejected and ignored. The sovereign will of God doesn't make them happen because you have a free will. The Bible says in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. First Thessalonians 518. When you're not thankful, your free will is overthrowing the sovereign will of God. The decreed, declared will of God stated on the pages of his Bible. And yet your free will can overthrow it. Um, point number five. I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Not very far. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4. Notice verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer, now watch it, according to the will of God, Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. God's will is for you to suffer for Jesus Christ. If any man suffer as a Christian, the text says. The text doesn't say God's will is for you to be tortured or for you to be imprisoned as a Christian. A lot of times some Christians have been thrown in jail because of something stupid they did. Like not paying their taxes, thinking, I don't have to do that. Yes, you do. I don't like it any more than you like it. The text doesn't say God's will is for you to be tortured or for you to be thrown in prison as Christians. Now, those days may come. And I don't doubt that those days are going to come. There, is, there are forces in this nation right now that want those days to come. Thank the Lord they're not here yet. But to suffer may be something as benign as being yelled at, being made fun of, being laughed at, being mocked because everyone else knows you're a Christian. They try to get a rise out of you. Verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. You might not enjoy it. Who does? But if you take it patiently, you honor Jesus Christ by that response. On your part, he is glorified. A lady I work with, I've worked with her for about eight years now, said to me just this past week, and she said it because she knows I'm a Christian, she knows I'm a preacher, and uh, she wasn't raised going to church, and she's got a bunch of liberal um, modern views of life anyway, she likes to throw them out there hoping to, you know, get me irritated. But she said, Jesus might have existed, but I don't think he was the son of God. I don't believe uh, in any afterlife or spiritual things. Once you're dead, that's it. I know she was trying to provoke me to get a rise out of me, but I wanted to ask if she actually thought her life had no purpose, had no significance, and that in the big picture she was contributing nothing to the world. Because that, that would be the logical assumption. But if I had said that, I would have created sparks in the, in the 
break in the break room at work. Right? Instead, I just listen to her, give me her opinions. You know, you kind of shake your head and with a smile on your face, confident in the knowledge that I'm right and she's wrong. <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 26, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. Then the next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Each person has to be dealt with separately. And you don't want to start fights with someone you're going to have to work with tomorrow and the day after and the day after and the day after. I have some great opportunities to engage Catholic priests when they're riding in the funeral car with me. But because I'm going to see that guy probably next week or in two weeks, I don't want these guys who don't know the Bible and they're unsaved anyway, calling my boss and saying, your guy comes on a little strong. You dumb fool, you're lost on your way to hell with a turned around shirt collar. You have no idea what's going on. Can't even talk to him about the scripture because he's never read the Bible. So you got to watch what you say. You have to, listen, you can't street preach all the time when you're in the car with somebody that, you know, that'd be fun. We'd like to try that, right? <laughs> Brother um, Joseph was talking about the Amplified Bible we were talking earlier. And I always thought the Amplified Bible meant, you know, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Amplified version, in the beginning, God, you know, you amplify it. It's amplified. But you, as a Christian, want to make Jesus Christ look good every chance you get. And if you suffer as a Christian, it's God's will for you to suffer, whether in small things or great things, patiently, because then you honor Jesus Christ by doing so. Are you too timid to pass out a gospel track? Let's leave one somewhere anonymously. Are you afraid of talking to people because you think you might offend them or make them mad? Are you afraid of being unable to answer every question they might pose? Then let me say, you are being unwilling to suffer for Jesus' sake. How difficult can it be to leave a track somewhere? You say, I'm, I'm, I'm always shy and nervous to talk to people. Leave the track somewhere and just run. <laughs> <laughs> but these five principles are clearly the will of God laid out in the Bible. There are still unanswered questions, though, in everyone's minds. What about that job? What about that person I'm, inter I'm interested in? What about that school and my education, all the rest? What is God's will for me? Well, let's review this. God's will is for you to be, number one, saved, Number two, spirit-filled. Number three, sanctified. Number four, in submission to all authorities over you. And number five, willing to suffer if it comes to that. Thank the Lord we're not living like Richard Wormbrand had to. I mean, spent 14 years in a Romanian prison. If you, and this is a big if, if you can honestly say, I'm following God in all of these points, and only God knows if that's true or not, but if you can honestly say, I'm trying to follow the Lord in all five of these things, then my last point is this. Do whatever you want to do with your life. The Bible says, delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Psalm 37, verse 4. The things you want, the things you desire, will be the things that God desires for you. Your whole wants and desires and priorities will change if those things are in place. You'll think about where I should work. If it's going to 
uh, hurt my spiritual life, who I should associate my, myself with, what young lady, what young man I should let myself be drawn to, you know, see if something there that might develop, if they're not on the same page with me as a believer, as a true believer, and I would say as a Bible believer. Amen. Our young people, you have so much more than the young people of so many other churches. Most, many of them don't even know what it is to be saved, let alone Bible-believing Christians. Don't settle for someone who's not a true believer in the perfection of the Word of God. Because you won't be on the same page. You'll never have close fellowship with that other person. But the things you want, the things you desire, will become the things that God wants for you. That job, that education, that marriage, and so forth. But if you're saved, point number one, and yet you neglect points numbers two, three, four, and five, then forget it. You're going to wander and stumble around having no idea what God's will is for you because you're not seeking after it. Let me close right here. <coughs> King David said, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. This is why we can only go to the word of God to begin answering that question, what is God's will for me? Take those things that are clearly spelled out as God's will, and if those things are in order, then the desires of your heart will be the desires of God's heart. You won't be stumbling, wondering, what should I do? Where should I go? Because those instincts will already be in you by the power of the Holy Ghost, right? Right? 